Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. Glad you're all here. Before we get started, I just want to say a couple of thank yous to some people who've helped make tonight's program possible. First, I'd like to thank our videographer, Lisa Kempton. She has uh, videoed our hearing panels, or I'm sorry, our history panels for the past two years and is also available for other videography services. Her contact information is in the program if you should need her services. I'd also like to thank Stonewall Columbus, who, has, who have supported this program for the past two years, and without their support, it wouldn't be possible. Our other partners are the Gay Ohio History Initiative, the Our Stories Project at The Ohio State University, and the Ohio Historical Society. One other thing I want to mention before we get started, in the back of the room on the table is a mini Pride Guide. On the back of that, it lists all of the events going on this week in Pride. I want to direct your attention to one event in particular. Uh, this Sunday, June 24th, is the Pride Brunch at the Hyatt Regency. Tickets are $35 and $50, and it's a good time. If you're interested in a ticket, you just need to contact Stonewall Columbus. Tonight's program is part three of a four-part series looking at gay history in Central Ohio. Next week's program will be also on Wednesday at 7 p.m. It will be downstairs, and it's just going to be a series of videos uh, looking at gay history in Central Ohio in the 1980s. I think we're going to be watching uh, some video of the first Pride Parade in 1982, maybe some video of the second Pride Parade. Stonewall Columbus used to have a uh, program on public access cable back in the 80s. We may take a look at that. And then Stonewall commissioned a movie about when city council promised to adopt uh, anti-discrimination uh, legislation and then backed out at the last minute. Tonight's program is entitled Cruising, Male Dating, and Sex Before AIDS and the Internet, and we have a distinguished panel with us tonight. I'll introduce you to them. All the way at the end is Douglas Whaley. Next to him is Jerry Gordon. Next to him is Russ Goodwin, and then I'm going to be moderating tonight's panel. So uh, I want to encourage everyone, participation is encouraged. If you hear a story up here and it causes you to remember a story of your own, feel free to stand up and uh, ask for the opportunity to share your story. Also, if you have questions, feel free to stand up or raise your hand to ask your question. We don't anticipate that this small number of people will be able to represent the breadth and diversity of the whole community, so if you have something you want to add, feel free to do so at any time. I thought we would get started tonight by asking everyone on the panel to answer that age-old question. How did you first realize that you were gay? And um, please you don't want... start with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm All right. shy. All right. I'll start. Uh, I think the, as I look back on it now, I think I first realized that I was attracted to men probably when I was in first grade. I can remember I had a classmate that I was friends with, and I just couldn't stop touching him. I just wanted to be close to him. And it, it wasn't necessarily a sexual thing, but it was definitely a, an intimacy thing that I was drawn to. Now, of course, I didn't know that I was gay at that point in time. Uh, I probably didn't put a name on it and actually identify myself as being a gay male until I was 15. And uh, my good friend Tom, one, time, one night I was uh, staying over at his house, and he confessed to me that he was gay, and I immediately said, well, I am too. <laughs> so I think that's probably when I first came out. I don't think I ever was straight. <laughs> um, from my earliest... Um, recollections I was attracted to men. I, I vividly remember at like three years old um, going to the swimming pool with my older brothers and lingering in the changing room and looking at the older guys and just looking and sort of I mean in a three-year-old's mind if you could lust I was lusting at that point <laughs> and wondering when I was gonna look like they did. Um, you know watching the you know it, it was very I didn't know the word erotic or anything like that, but I was having those erotic feelings uh, watching these older boys get undressed and back in the 50s people wore speedos and that kind of stuff. <laughs> but uh, watching them pull them on and, and uh, so I would, I would always spend an extra 10 minutes in the locker room watching them. But um, I came out really early. Um, I gave my coming out from 14 the first time that I solicited and was successful in obtaining sex from another guy. Um, I started going to bars at 16 here, the Kismet, the Cat's Meow, uh, the Grotto, which a couple of us were talking about. And, um, so in two years I have been out 
40 years. So. Well, does anybody remember the movie star called Robert Taylor? Yes. <laughs> Well, I used to think he was something else, and I had a poster of Robert Taylor in my room. <laughs> and uh, that would be uh, the only thing I can say that really I was feeling towards that at that time. I went all the way through um, high school. Uh, I was not out. I went through college, and I went into the service. I did manage to find a couple very nice friends in the service that, that we were quite good buddies. Uh, but I really didn't come out till after I came back from the service and came to Columbus, and that was back in 1946. And uh, I can still remember going to the Hotel Chittenden, the Oasis Bar down there was a a beautiful round circular bar so you could sit over here and see somebody over here and it was fun and I met two very very close friends that were came very close to me uh, from that place so that was back so see I really didn't come out until I was 20 uh, about 25 so that's my answer <laughs> I have a very complicated story, which we don't have time for. On one level, like Russ, I always knew. On another level, the denial was humongous. So I made all the usual mistakes. I got married. I'm a father, and I don't regret those things in terms of the, my ex-wife. She and I are about to go to New York and see shows together, celebrating her 60th birthday in August. We're still good friends. My son called me for Father's Day, and so I, wouldn't, I don't regret all of that. But as I said at one of these panels, what happened to me was marijuana. Um, <laughs> it was very, very good for me. Um, with, if you're high on marijuana, you can concentrate on one thing at a time, and in my case, it was whether or not I was gay. And so I was 31 years old when I finally talked truth to myself, and Ohio State had made me an offer uh, to be a visiting professor at the law school here. So I was teaching at Indiana. So I came here to come out and entered into the period we're all going to have stories for that the period that many one of my friends called the no standards period <laughs> <laughs> particularly gay men in the room may remember that the lesbians of course were much more circumspect about it. Uh, so I, again I was 32 when I came out and uh, that would have been 1976 but I was here from the beginning of 76 and, so I had a good run before AIDS set in and I managed to get in my share of fun <laughs> All right, gentlemen, uh, how did you, after you realized that uh, you were gay and that you wanted to act on it and meet other gay people, how did you figure out what you needed to do or where you needed to go in order to meet those gay people? Well, I have a story on that. Uh, I arrived here in town in January of 76, and I was determined I was going to become a gay man. You know, like, uh, I didn't have a clue how to do it. I would heard about the the thing just north of campus where people drove around, what was that called? The Wall. The wall. <laughs> and I actually did pick someone up at The Wall, but that didn't seem very promising to me. So I wanted to go to a gay bar, and I had, again, a clue, how do you do it? So I had cocktail lounges in the Yellow Pages. I looked up a bar, and it was on Gay Street, and I thought, okay, it's not going to be a gay bar, but I don't need that. And I called it, and the bartender answered, and I said, is this a gay bar? He said, no. I said, what's the name of the gay bar? He said, Kismet. I said, thank you. <laughs> so, Friday night at 8 o'clock in the evening, I went to the Kismet. Fellini could have cast his movies out of the 12 people nearest the door of the old Kismet at 8 o'clock on a Friday night. Well, before the Kismet, uh, the place that I told you about, uh, the, the Chittenden Hotel, the, the Oasis Bar, I really felt that I just walked in there one night and uh, saw people and most of them were guys and uh, I, 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 this one good looking man and he was looking back at me and uh, I, I, I believe he came over and sat next to me and uh, we talked that night and I asked him if he'd like to have dinner with me the next night. So uh, the next night I went down and sure enough Ray was there. And his name was Ray Monsavacci. 
that rhymes with itchy scratchy. <laughs> <laughs> he was a wonderful, wonderful man. He was a tremendous um, inspirational speaker and traveled all over the country. And unfortunately, he died very young, 52, he died. But uh, not through AIDS, it's that AIDS was not, at that time, was still not around. But uh, anyway, uh, when I met him at the bar, uh, this one night, the second night after we had dinner, when I, we went back to the hotel, he says, uh, why don't you come out the room? I want to show you my knife trick. <laughs> <laughs> I went up to the room <laughs> and I had asked him to see the knife trick before I left, but he showed me a few other tricks. <laughs> Wait, you can't drop it there. What was the knife trick? <laughs> I don't remember too much. He did do one. There was a knife. There was a knife. That's actually sort of scary. <laughs> I, I, I grew up in Columbus, so I kind of had it lucky. I uh, remember vividly, uh, well, every morning my mother listened to WTVN radio. And they had the news on, and then they played Easy Listening, Montavani, and all that, Percy Faith. So um, one morning I'm sitting there eating my Cocoa Puffs and drinking my orange juice. Um, the news comes on and says 14 men, perverts, picked up along the Olin Tantra River north of Ohio State. And I was like five years old, and I'm going, okay, file this away for <laughs> future reference. And, you know, I didn't really think of it. So here I am, you know, I, I, the first person I slept with at 14 was the drama teacher at Westerville High School. Um, he was like 32 years old. Hot little seven. And you seduced him. And I seduced him. Married, went home to his wife's home, you know. And uh, so I'm thinking, I'm going, okay, this was a, this was fun. Now where can I, where can I go? And in the back of my mind, there was this old Antarctic River. And, <laughs> and it was behind the old Big Bear that used to be a roller skating. And it got Lane Avenue, which is now the Holiday Inn where the Tuttle baseball fields are and where the Tuttle pool is. There were paths that went all the way up to Ackerman. And then to the, you know, there was a very short bank that went down to the river and then there was woods that went to the cliff that went up. Those woods were riddled with paths. And so I just went down there one spring afternoon in my little hot pants and my tube socks and my pumas <laughs> and my little tight t-shirt and I still had a skinny little body, and, and uh, started walking back there. And I stayed on the gravel path, but I kept seeing guys that kept scootering back when they'd see me coming. You know, I was like 14, 15 years old, so you know, was, they would skitter back into the thing to like, like scare deer. So I said, I'm following them and see what happens. And I walked back there, and sure enough, the perverts were there. <laughs> and uh, so from there, I met a couple people, and Unlike Mr. Gordon, I don't remember a single name of any of these people. <laughs> because if you knew their first name, you were in a long-term relationship. <laughs> um, and it was all instant gratification. That was all it was. And then one guy I did talk to, and I asked him about bars, and he told me about the Cat's Meow, which is now kind of a nice restaurant, the Flatiron. Um, and, That's right. That's um, right. I forgot about that. I went in there, and... Uh, I played the little pouty game where, you know, I had a dollar in my pocket. I had a dollar to buy gas to get downtown, and I had a dollar in my pocket uh, to buy beer. And if you, I figured out if you sat there and looked sad, there was a beer in front of you. <laughs> Nobody carded anybody back then, so, you know, there's a beer in front of me. So I played that game for a while. And I'd get drunk there and then go to the kids and dance my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what everyone has, has shared kind of raises a point, which is all you needed to do was to find one place, and then after that you could make contact with people who could then lead you to somewhere else that you might be able to go. Um, one of the things that I remember, and I don't know that's directly related to this, but it popped into my head listening to the discussion was, and I, I don't recall seeing this so much anymore these days, but I can remember if you went into a public restroom, so often there would be things written on the wall about come back here at X hour to meet a person, or this is a good place to be and on a certain day of the week, or whatever. And I, I think a lot of gay men used 
public restrooms as a way to communicate and as a way to facilitate connections. So, and they, I mean, they would be so bold as to write it on the, or scratch it into the wall of the, of the, the public restroom to clue other people into when they might come back and be able to meet them. And I can remember seeing those kinds of things and, 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 that, and realizing that that must mean that that's a place where you could go if you wanted to, to meet somebody in that way. The other thing and, that... Wait, wait, and did you do it? No, I... I, I Sissy. I, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. I mean, I, I, I certainly wasn't a Puritan, but that, that wasn't my uh, scene at that point in time. The other thing I remember is, if you listen really closely, every once in a while, straight people would mention where the, the fags went to meet. I mean, you'd hear, oh, there's a gay bar over there, or oh, that park is where all the queers go, or something. And it, it seemed like straight people might have an inkling as to where things were at, and if you listen carefully, you might find out about that one place where you could then go and, and make some sort of a connection. Uh, and, and years ago, very different than now, I mean, no gay newspapers, no gay TV programs, very few gay books. I can remember going to the library back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and if you were lucky enough to find uh, a gay book listed in the card catalog, it would be stolen. It would be gone because no gay person would want to check out a gay book because that would reveal that they were gay. So most of the books were stolen by people that, uh, or maybe maybe they read them and misfiled them somewhere and they never came back, but even finding literature or information was a real challenge. So... Um, and those books frequently lied, too. Oh, yeah. yeah they were uh, also... Uh, at the public restrooms back in uh, probably the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, when Union Station was there, they had what they called glory hose there and in the old uh, Greyhound bus station before they ever had the video, the sex video arcade. So they had glory hose way back then at public restrooms. You might define a glory hole for those in the audience that don't know what they are. Oh. <laughs> a glory hole is like between the... Uh, stall partition. The stalls. You know, where they would have a hole in the wall, and you could stick your thing through the wall, maybe get a blow job or whatever. It was romantic as all get out. <laughs> it was uh, just it's, as... Uh, it's anonymous as you get. Exactly. The aroma was great, too. If you the need a quickie. The aroma. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, man. That yeah. bus station, yeah. So we, we've talked a little bit about how gay people met. Give us your perspective, uh, each of you, and we'll, we'll start on the end with Doug. What were, what were gay relationships like? Were there, when, you, when you were first coming out, did you know other gay couples that were in committed relationships, or were the men just running wild? Well, there were both, of course. Um, the, I, again, I came here to come out, and we're talking about 1976, so it's much later than some of the periods that uh, the two of you are talking about. And by that time, the Stonewall Revolution had happened so that there, there were beginnings of a, of a real gay movement going on. I really, uh, I was a law professor at Ohio State University, and so I was avoiding the kind of things I, I have to apologize, calling you a sis, calling you a sissy. I, wasn't interested in anything that was going to get me arrested, and I was a little afraid of the uh, the gay bar scene too, because it hadn't been so very long before that that the gays were being arrested as they came out of the bars, and that's our you're you're bound to have stories about about those kinds of days too, and fortunately I missed all of those. But I, in addition to that, no standards period, and I want to tell you I had a very good time. <laughs> I was very interested in getting into the social scene here, or in Huntington being. Uh, the, one of the people I was trying to get invited to his parties, and um, there was an illustrator of dogs who was a famous uh, dog illustrator. He taught at OSU and he had a partner named Charlie, and they were they'd been together 50 years, and uh, I, I got to know them. I can't I think of his name, and so I gradually moved into to a social circle. And my second year, I was at a, a Valentine's Day party and met my uh, partner of then for four and a half years, romantic as all get out. He was across the room, it's just like some enchanted evening. He wasn't my type, but I looked at him and thought, oh, that's very important. And we were together before, we moved in together before the week was out. Well, uh, I, don't, I, did, I never had any trouble at all 
after I started. In other words, I kept it separate. There was no at work, nothing about gay. It was all separate. But you made your own friends. You had your own circle of friends. You mentioned Orrin Huntington. He is one, and then it's a group. He's in the age group that I was in. And uh, you also, the gay women, um, they they worked along with you. So if we, I had a function to go to. I always had a good friend was a gay, and she would go with me. And that's what the way you you played it, but you. You had to do that or you'd lose your job. But it was fun too. In other words, it was just, uh, I, 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 those people at, at the early times, I'm endeared to them because uh, it was something that we all, had, we all shared. You would have um, you, different parties you'd go for Thanksgiving and they became family. And you all became one big family. And there was a thrill and a mystery to it, too. I yes, there was. In other words, um, <laughs> it was nice to, to uh, you could keep it quiet that way. But we didn't, uh, we didn't miss out on any good times. Uh, we had lots of fun. And uh, it was just that you were careful. And you talked about the wall before the wall that was around the state house that the cars would ride around the state house. I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, the wall, people would cruise around the bus stations. Mm -hmm. um, downtown. Right. Um, but, uh, what was the bus? <laughs> um, I never had any trouble meeting people. I mean, I could just walk down the street and you catch somebody's eye. And you would walk about 10 steps and turn around. If they were staring back at you, you would walk another few steps and look at them looking back at you again. One of you would turn around and start following the other person. It was pretty easy. I mean, we would cruise going up and down High Street. It was two lanes going up High Street. You'd see somebody that was cute and pull up next to it and kind of catch their eye. You probably just came into my ice cream parlor too then, didn't I you? I did. <laughs> many times, yes. Many, many times into the ice cream parlor. You had some cute young men working in there, as I recall. We always had very nice looking people working for me. Two of my good friends worked for you, Michael Brandt and Gordon Zelensky. Michael Brandt is, uh, that's his partner. And that's your partner? Where is Michael? Michael's at my house. I haven't seen Michael Brandt for years. What's your name? That's good. That's good. But uh, um, I guess because I was younger, I was a little more at ease with everything. I kind of came out right after Stonewall riots and I read about it in Time and Newsweek, so I just didn't care, you know. I didn't, I had nothing to hide. I was in high school and I was in college. I was working in a drapery department at J.C. Penney. How gay is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, you were in the Navy too. You were well, this is all before this. I didn't, I joined the Navy in 77. Every duty station I went to, people knew I was gay. I. That's when I became serial monogamous. Well, well, in 1980 when I went to Japan, I became serially monogamous. I had a series of like year-long um, uh, relationships for three years, and then I moved to Okinawa. I met my partner, and we were together for 16 years. But um, and then the U.S. immigration policy broke us up. But um, it was very easy for me. I didn't, you know, I wasn't employed. I wasn't worried about a career. I didn't know what my career was going to be. I was a theater major at Ohio State, so everybody was gay. Everybody I knew was gay. All my friends were gay by then. So um, we lived a very open, very gay life in Columbus. I remember there was a little bar rag, um, not to contradict you, but there was a little mimeographed bar rag that would be sitting on top of the cigarette machines every week at the Kismet. I remember in 19, summer of 1976, there was a gay rights rally at the State House, and the, gay, the rag said, if you're embarrassed or you're afraid to come, and your picture's going to be, where, be taken, wear a mask, because the police were always out taking your picture. And uh, my friend Michael and I were the only ones that went there without a mask on, 
And there were speeches and stuff. This is 76. Um, it was uh, sponsored by the GAA at Ohio State, the Gay um, Activists Alliance. Um, that's my first foray into politics, was becoming a member of that in my freshman year. Um, but uh, no, it was, for me, being so young, it was very easy to be gay. And I, I, I didn't have to go through the hiding that uh, people a generation uh, before me had to go to. Uh, I did witness um, some police harassment in bars and things like that. I mean, as, as late as uh, I, got, I came back to Columbus in 96, and I believe in 97 or 98 there were bar raids here in Columbus then also. And there was a, a big uh, uh, brouhaha and a, a big meeting with the police department down in the new police uh, headquarters in their auditorium about police harassment and bar raids where they actually put people down on the floor and you know zip tied their hands and, and stuff on the premise they were looking for drugs in specific bars. But, uh, so that stuff can still go on. In the early days of Stonewall, we used to go out to the police academy and have a, uh, a day where we uh, tried to, to moderate their reactions to the gay community. And the horror stories we would hear from the policemen about, well, when I was a young rookie, they took me into the Kismet and said, pick out which one we're gonna throw in jail. Just anyone, it won't matter, and, and I mean, that kind of attitude was going on, so um, the police have come a long way too, though by no means are they necessarily our friends. We've, we've talked a little bit about uh, bars so far. I guess I'm curious uh, to hear everyone's, my first time at a bar story, <laughs> and to, to give everyone a moment to gather thoughts, I'll, I'll tell my first time at a bar story. Uh, when I was in high school, when I was 15, and my friend Tom said to me, I'm gay, and I said, oh, I am too. Uh, he was a fast mover, and he immediately discovered where the uh, neighboring uh, gay bar was at in a neighboring town, and kept trying to convince me to come to the bar. And um, I was uh, afraid. I wasn't sure whether that was where I really wanted to go. And at that time, I didn't have a car, so it meant taking my parents' car, which was a little bit frightening as well. And finally, I can remember I got my courage up and uh, decided I was going to go and meet him there. And I pull into the parking lot and park my parents' big Chrysler, I don't know, New Yorker or something, I don't remember what it was. And no sooner had I like taken the keys out than a police officer pulls up next to me and asks me what I'm doing and wants my ID. And of course, at that time I was in high school, so I wasn't nearly old enough to be in a bar. And we had a long conversation about how I wasn't going in there, how I had just stopped because I had lost my way and I was trying <laughs> to, to figure out the directions to get on moving where I was going. And uh, then I left and um, drove around the block a couple of times and came back and he was gone. And then I, I went inside and, and everything was fine. So which, which bar was it? It was uh, Richard's in Mansfield, Ohio. Oh, oh. man. <laughs> <laughs> um, my first time was pretty nondescript. It was, you know, just went in, had, had a drink, and went out. The most traumatic experience early on was when I was at the Kismet, and I saw a friend from high school. And I freaked out. Oh, my God, he's going to tell my sister. Even though my mother and father already knew, my, my brothers and sisters didn't. So I go, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Rob's here. i got to get out of here. I hope he didn't see me. And I run, and I'm halfway home. And I'm like, wait. <laughs> if Rob's there, <laughs> so I turn around and go back. You know, back then in Sanford Hansen, you only had to pay a cover charge once. And I still had two tickets for drinks. So. You used to pay a dollar to get in and you get two tickets for, for beer. And beer was 25 cents a can then, so I wasn't giving up my 50 cents worth of beer. <laughs> and uh, I went back in and we became uh, fast. We were friends since elementary school, but we became really good friends. Not sexual friends, just really good friends. And we're still friends to this day. He's an, he's an actor in New York. He's an actor in New York. He's a bartender. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you the story of Monsalvacci. That really was the first time because Monsalvacci did bring me out. And so from that time on, I knew that. But we had the, there were several places to go that I, I liked. And one that I can't remember the name of it. But it was on right across from uh, the fairgrounds out on 11th Avenue, and it would hold about 200 to 300 people. 
Now, they did have, uh, they had lights that would flicker if the, somebody was coming that they thought was going to be a police. You couldn't be sitting on somebody's lap or if they came in. But I was never there when they had ever taken anybody out. But uh, I, I, I don't remember the name of the, of the, the bar, but I, I always remember the name of the building next to the bar, Hughes Peters. <laughs> <laughs> what did they sell? <laughs> they sold electronic equipment. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember that name. Terry used to stand underneath that sign. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I told you about the night I went into the Kismet, but nothing came of that. But I just shortly thereafter discovered Ties, which was a very good bar. And I started going into Ties, and you understand, I was still married, and I was terrified what this was going to do to my career, and I'd sit in the corner of the bar and just watch gay men be affectionate with one another with my jaw open. That just could not be. It was such a foreign world to me. And I sat behind that bar for like a month and a half. I didn't live very far away. I was living down on Mound Street. And so eventually I wandered away from the bar, and I wandered down, and then I started <coughs> meeting people. And I started standing at the edge of the dance floor and watching men dance with one another, thinking, wow, could I do that? I mean, I could always dance, but I never cared much for dancing. So I went home and I sort of practiced a little bit, and thank <laughs> God I did it. I got asked to dance the very next night, and that, that, was, that was thrilling. And those were the days before AIDS, so there was an enormous amount of very loose sex. Yeah. Tell, tell stories about that. <laughs> Sex, drugs, uh, all I remember about Ty's dancing on Ty's dance floor is poppers. There were a lot of poppers. Constant inhaling of poppers, and these were not the stuff you can buy now. These were medical grade amyl nitrate, and everybody mm -hmm. had the little bullets they wore around their, their neck, and some people had it soaked on, on rags that they kept in their mouth, so they were constantly inhaling it. The music, it was the first bar in Columbus to have a disc jockey, not. Before that, it was jukeboxes. And I'll tell you, at the Kismet, the jukebox went silent at about 1.45 in the morning, which is bar time, 2 o'clock. And that's when the girls would go up and they would start playing slow songs so they could dance. And it used to tick me off. I said, I got 30 more minutes to dance, and none of these, none of these sorry rich queens are going to go in there and put a quarter in that machine and play five songs? What's wrong with it? But ties, it was all about poppers, and it was all about drugs. Drugs have always been part, I think, well, since the 70s of gay culture, so. Let, let's hear those stories. <laughs> I don't have any wild ones, really. Oh, now, come back. Think no, back really, now. no. Honestly, I had fine relationships. Uh, another gentleman I, I met, uh, he eventually became the night manager at the Fairmont Hotel out in San Francisco. So I had trips out there, which was a lot of fun. But uh, no, I, mine was mostly with groups of friends, and we had piled around together, the lesbians and, and the uh, gay men. Friendships were really, really, really important back then. Yes. I think a lot more than they are now. Um, and, and people became fast friends very quickly, and um, I don't, I've never had friendships the way I had when I was in high school and college. Um, and I know most people say that, but these are, um, um, I watched a lot of these people die, and mm. I still think about them every single day, um, and I remember their names, and I remember what we did, and where we did it, and what drugs we did together, and what bars we went to dance at, and um, which beaches we went to, we kind of christened Delaware Beach when it first opened up here, it became the gay beach for a long time. So I, I think even more, more than today, people, and, and they weren't small groups. You see small groups of friends now. You don't see these 50, packs of 50 people that went places together, and they were really, really good friends, all 50 of them, you know. Uh, and then, you know, you had your people who came and went because they were the, they were the boyfriends that were there for a week or two <laughs> weeks, and then they kind of left. And then... I hate the I hate the term, but every group had two or three fag hags. I really hate that term. I used it a lot back then, but uh, they were uh, everybody knows it. Straight women who identified with with 
gay males, and most of them were heavy set for some reason. They would, you know, this was the 70s disco era. They were all glittered out, glitter, you know, big hair and big shoes, and, you know, and they hung around with us because we always would, oh, you're beautiful, you look great, you know, and, you know, they were, and they, they did kind of act as our beards when they needed to be. Um, all right. One of the things we've been talking wait, about. Wait, let's hear about about your wild experiences as a, a boy. My my wild experiences? Well, Dean must have had an interesting period, Rob. All, all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to think about how to how to begin this. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll begin it this way. My, my friend Tom from high school, when I was 15, that we mutually came out to each other. He was Catholic, and of course, the same night that we came out to each other, we had sex. Uh, of course, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. He was riddled with guilt. So, so I had to, I was like hounding him, you know, let's do it again. Come on, let's have sex. Let's have sex again. He was like, no, no, I feel too guilty. I feel too guilty. So I, was, I, I reached out to other people that I suspected as being gay in high school and started also going out to the gay bars. So I would, on the weekends, I would drive to Mansfield to go to the gay bar, hang out there, have an adventure, meet somebody, have sex in my parents' car, whatever the case may be and then come back on Monday and everyone would be talking at school about what they had done over the weekend and I would just be sitting there silently thinking, you don't know anything. <laughs> you know, they'd be like, oh, I went to the football game or I went to somebody's house for a party and I'm thinking, I live in a world that's much wilder than you can even imagine. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I agree with Russ at that time, I mean, they never asked for an ID. They didn't yeah. care. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting this was a positive thing, but in fact the bars liked younger people to come into the bar because there was a certain clientele at the bar that liked the idea of some fresh meat coming in and some new people to, to, to pick over for <laughs> sexual gratification. The, the flip side of that, I would say, is uh, when, when I first started going out, I mean, the bar was the only place you could go. There weren't gay social clubs. Uh, there were other like cruisy places, like if you wanted to go to a rest area and pick somebody up, you might be able to do that, or go to a public restroom somewhere. But the bars were really the only social outlet where I grew up that people could go and meet other gay people. So th the bar was not only a place to drink, it was also kind of the community center. And it was, it was the key place of socialization so that you could go there and feel safe. And it may be the only place that you went all week long where you could feel 100% authentic and safe at the same time. And then there were definitely some downsides to the bars, the drinking and, and uh, some of the uh, more manipulative promiscuity, uh, people preying on people, those sorts of things. But at the time, it was, it was the best thing you had going for being able to get in touch with your gay side without exposing yourself to ridicule or even assault. I can remember, I mean, from grade school forward, I mean, you know, when, when you're gay, I mean, you know, first you're the sissy or the pansy, and then, and then you become the, the gay person or the queer or the fag or whatever. And uh, I, I grew up in a town of 600 people, and I, I mean, regularly, people threatened to beat me up, and occasionally they did, you know, just solely based upon the fact that, that they thought that I was gay or they figured out that I was gay or they knew I was gay, whatever. So having a safe space like a bar that you could go into and know that you can be yourself and, and nobody's going to beat you up was a, was a really important thing and a, a way to allow you to grow and feel safe. Because uh, there, there were no other places in the world at that time. I mean, there, there weren't other outlets. How badly were you beat? Uh, I, mean, I mean, just like punch, spit on, kicked, shoved, that sort of thing. Yeah, that happened. In I was pretty good at running, so <laughs> I, I didn't stick around forward. But well, Let's talk about violence, Russ. Um, as, a, as a kid, I wasn't the most masculine young boy around. Um, I was extremely small. I think I was 3'10 until I was 15. Um, and I had two older brothers who, who were big and, you know, jock types and stuff. And, and I was sandwiched in between two girls. And, and I kind of liked to play with Barbies. And, and that I never, you know, my parents would try and force trucks and... and World War II rifles and Roy Rogers stuff on me because I still, you know, I had my little Roy Rogers suit. 
they didn't know how gay that really was. <laughs> they figured it out in the 70s when the village people came out. Um, but I had all that stuff, you know, but I never wanted to play with it. I wanted to play with my sisters and the girls in the neighborhood when we played, you know, that kind of stuff. And, but I was, um, so I, I had my fair share of talking from kids in the neighborhood. And, you know, I grew up, it was a, a, a World War II baby boom housing complex on northeast side of Columbus behind Northern Line Shopping Center. So there were kids everywhere. I mean, every house had at least four kids, um, and when you were going, you walked to school, you walked home, so you were you were taunted if you were the sissy. You were taunted all the way to elementary school. You were taunted all the way home, and then in the summer, we were turned out at seven o'clock in the morning, and not expected to be back until noon. Turned out again after after your peanut butter sandwich, and not expected to be back till dinner, and then turned out after dinner until dark. So you're out you're out running everywhere wherever you wanted to on your bike all day long. So there were so many opportunities to be beat up. And I started to learn how to fight, you know. Um, and I would fight back, but I'd inevitably end up with my face in the dirt or, or something like that. <coughs> and, um, as it moved into junior high school and high school, it kind of all stopped. Um, um, I made friends and um, I, I became active in a lot of activities in school after <coughs> after elementary school you start having extracurricular activities and all this kind of stuff after school and i you know um i was a swimmer so i was in the swim clubs in this and, and that kind of stuff and and the swim teams when we had them in, in high school so i kind of earned a little cred for being a pseudo jock because i swam and dove and uh, so that kind of stopped, and as an adult, I've never had any, uh, other than a few verbal things thrown at me as I'm walking down the street and some drunk kid drives up High Street or something, and that happens now to this day, you know. They just see somebody that's walking through the short north and they think they have to yell fag out the window. But other than that, I haven't had anything since probably all interest. Well, I haven't had anything since uh, third, fourth, and fifth grade, sixth grade. Um, I came from a town called Bridgeport, and uh, we were, uh, I lived up on Caddis Pike, and we were being sent to a school called Etneville. That was one of the divisions of a small, small town, but we still had our different schools, different places. And it was where the steel workers' um, children was this came. And uh, of course, I, uh, could tap dance. I was out singing at the church, all the things like that uh, in my young days. And uh, I was also, I have to admit, the teacher's pet in the fifth and sixth grade. And I'm proud of it because when he became 90, 90 years old, I got a phone call. And uh, he says, you'll never guess who this is. And I says, it's Mr. Huff. I remembered his voice. Yeah. So between, he lived to be 100. And between as 90 and 100 years old, we wrote five hymns together. He would send me words and I'd put music to them. Uh, but uh, back at that time, I, you know, I was one that uh, was liked by the teachers, but I wasn't liked by the guys very well. And uh, my first name was Gerald, so I became Geraldine and all that. <laughs> 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 And I was supposed to be beat up the last day of school, so what somebody told me. Um, and I said, uh, so I debated whether, I went to school, but they didn't touch me. But outside of that, I can't complain at all. And my life has been fine. And I think it's, uh, it's just one of those things. And in other words, uh, I'm not a flame. So, but uh, and I, I'm so proud of my ice cream and candy shop that we had. Uh, Should have grown bigger, but I, I I loved having it, and it was a place for everybody. So I mean, it wasn't. Uh, and I thought that when I had my own, own business, it would be easier for me to be gay if I wanted to be, and it wasn't. It was more difficult. But I had all these people, the other people. But I still. My friends, and then I hired a lot of a lot of gay people, 
I mean, and they found out, and so they they would you know they come up. But it was a it was a place everybody loved. If you don't know, Gordon's Ice Cream and Candies was an institution on campus. He had two stores, one at uh, Lane and High, and one what, right across from High Union. Yeah, right across from the High Union, and they were this is the best ice cream I ever had. So. We went into ice cream because uh, all the ice cream places were going out. At that time, I was working at Chem Abstracts. I had no, I, my mother had started a candy business, and um, but uh, I, I always am so happy that this room became available four doors south of the store when we put in the parlor. And then I, I had to get into it, it was just too much. It was the most pleasant <coughs> years of my life as far as work history. It was just wonderful. The people that came in, the mothers and the kids and the gays and whatever, we had them all. Um, I got involved in an incident, leaving the rudely elegant one night with my partner. He climbed in the car and as I walked around the side of the car, there was a group of teenagers. They started yelling faggots and I got kicked. It was mostly half-hearted things, so this one guy just let loose and kicked me in the groin as hard as he could possibly kick. That proved to be very painful, and uh, I don't want to describe it to you, but I had a lot of trouble with that. When we were creating Stonewall Columbus, there were lots of threats, but nothing ever came of them. What, what sorts of threats were made? Death threats. Mm -hmm. I, I think I mentioned one of these history things. I learned how to handle death threats from my mother. Uh, my father was a <laughs> prosecutor in Dallas, Texas, and he was prosecuting the career criminals. That's the mafia. And my mother would get all these threats. So when I started, and a, a lot of us in Stonewall in the early days were getting these threats. Rhonda, uh, for example, and Craig Covey. And, you know, and I, I, we were all over television and, you know, and on the radio and so forth. And there were people who couldn't, and still can't, handle that sort of thing. And he, I'd, they'd call and threaten you. And so my mother said, what you do is you hit the cradle a couple of times and you say, Operator, this is one of those calls. Please trace it. And they hang up instantly. And my mother said, and the opposite happened of what they planned. They called to scare you. <laughs> so that, this, of course, before caller ID or anything like that. Because I actually only attacked once. That's enough. Oh, yeah, that was enough. Sitting here listening to everyone's recollections reminded me of something that, that I had a realization about again and again. And that was so frequently the people that were the bashers or gay people themselves, I don't know how many times I would discover that where somebody who had the loudest, it wasn't somebody necessarily who was going to hit you, but somebody who had the loudest mouth about your being gay, ultimately you would see them at the bar, you know, or you would find out that they were gay themselves, and I guess that was their safest cover to pr protect them from being suspected as not being masculine would be to accuse someone else, and then it distracted the attention from them. But I, I, I at least a half a dozen times I had that happen where I discovered later that the person... Well, especially high school kids. Um, I mean, the pressure to be the same and to fit in in high school is, is just amazing. So when you didn't fit in, and people knew I was gay in high school, um, I did get that verbal abuse, and then I ended up seeing most of those people who were the worst abusers of the kids later on. And they always apologized. That's hard for doing that. But they were trying to you know, cover up, and they, you know, they were dating girls, and I did that. It's, it's true, and we just saw it again by the, the, the minister out in Colorado, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. what Shakespeare said, he thinks he does the protest too much, <laughs> you know, some of the, some of the people who, who berate us and, and uh, uh, belittle us the most end up being the guys that are ordering the escorts up to their room and cruising Berliner Park and, and that kind of stuff. So we've we've touched on this a little bit, but I just wanted to make sure if there was any any other different stories or observations people had. Um, the topic of cruisy places. Uh, we, we've we've talked about the wall <coughs> at OSU. You, you mentioned the, the the trails over next to the river. Um, we've we've talked about a couple of locations. Anyone else have anything else? Oh, the State House. That was one of the things that, that Jerry mentioned. They're everywhere. They were everywhere. Northland Shopping Center, Eastland Shopping Center, Westland Shopping Center, um, the bookstores, Morris Road, the Lion's Den. There was a bookstore down where City Center is now. Tides is where was is where City Center Garage is now. Uh, uh, God, they were everywhere. 
the wall was up around Patterson and High Street and Northwich, I think, and cars would just circle and circle. And guys, we got to the point where we, there were no after hours bars. So we didn't want to go home at 2.30. So we'd all go to the wall and we'd sit along the wall. And the guy who lived in that house, and if you go up that street, you'll, uh, High Street up north of campus, you'll see an actual wall. It's a retaining wall. It has a buttress that comes up. And the police used to come by there and take all the pictures. So I know somewhere down in the Marconi Hotel, I have my picture down there. And that's what everybody called the jail then. When you got picked up, you were spending the night at the Mar Marconi Jail. The, the Marconi Mar Hotel. Oh, um, because it was on Marconi. Okay. Yeah, but we would stand up there till 3, 4 in the morning. And, you know, some guys would go back in the alley and get picked up. Other guys would just stand out there and talk and, and everything. And sometimes you'd be there on a Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday come out. But there were cruisy places were everywhere, almost every city park. Um, Lazarus downtown was notorious. The restrooms downtown, um, the Union were cruisy bathrooms. Thompson Library. Oh, the old medical center. Yes. Arps Hall basement. Arps Hall, yeah. Was and the worst. The library. Um, when I first started going to Ohio You're talking State, about the, the OSU library. The OSU yes, library. OSU. Um, the, the basement, or the lower level where the study rooms and stuff were, the, the restrooms, you went to the last stall and they had stuff written all over the wall. And I remember, vividly I remember this. Um, there was a, a, a thing and I would read it, like I would go there, you know, and you know when I was studying I would, always made sure I went to the last stall because I wanted to read and see if there was anything new. And there was one that said, come to the 11th floor stacks. And I'm in one of those little cubicles that were back in the stacks where the grad students could study. And he said, I have red tennis shoes on. <laughs> and I went up there and I, I don't even remember what the books were about on that floor. Because I was so nervous. Because I wanted to see what this guy in red sneakers looked like. He was, he was there. I mean, and I could not. I mean, I went up there like for three weeks straight, every day. And he was there every day. And I could not go up and walk, talk to him. I don't know why. I think I was intimidated for some reason. He was very good looking, so that was probably why I was intimidated by him. But, uh, but you made cruising places. It wasn't just that they were established places. You made them wherever you were. Because I came to realize at a very early age, just like now, gay people are everywhere. And you meet people in the strangest location. It doesn't always have to be. It doesn't have to be in that cruising spot. I mean, it's, you, have a better, you have better luck if you go to yeah. an established cruising place. But some of the more interesting and fun people you meet, and some of the more, uh, I don't know, sexually charged experiences are when you just meet somebody walking down the street or you you know I, I don't know how to explain it but or you just you start following somebody and all of a sudden I, I remember at Northland Shopping Center I wasn't even up there to cruise and some guy followed me out to my car and I just looked at it and he goes so now what and I went okay get in <laughs> and took me home so you know and it was like he followed me for like an hour around Northland Shopping Center so, and I, and I vividly remember it, and this was probably, I was probably 19 at the time, and you know, uh, those kind of things stick in your mind. Any other cruisy places that you remember, Jared? Uh, no, they accept that the, uh, a lot of times after the bar would close, you wanted to leave someplace, and one place was Char Bar up in the university area, mm -hmm. and another place was um, way out on, uh, 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 East Broad Street it was a, a, a restaurant, an overnight restaurant, and we would drive way out there. But it was groups of people normally. I do remember Western Take Pancake House at the patio at Morris and Carl Road. It was taken over by the gays at 2.30 in the morning. And we'd still be sitting in there when the church crowd would start showing up on Sunday morning. Um, a little later, that closed, and a little later, it was the Golden Griddle in German Village, where the Blockbuster video store is now. There was, for a short time, a place called K's Down Under. It was on the west side of Gay Street. And they had drag shows in there. And 
after hours, the drag queens served breakfast. And you went in and you got, they, I vividly remember, they, they would make coffee in these great big kettles. I don't know how they made it. And they would come around with a cart with this great big kettle and they would ladle coffee into your cup. <laughs> the K's Down Under got burnt down one night because they forgot to turn off the propane. <laughs> <laughs> so that ended. But um, kind of like now where everybody goes out to uh, and gets a barnyard buster or, or something that there's always been an after hours eatery in Columbus to go to. Can, can I ask Jerry a question? I had, I had an old timers from when I first started coming out here used to talk about after hours lease busting parties. That if the bar was closing and it was your turn to have the party, everyone would just move to your house and then the landlord lord would throw you out the next week. Does uh, that sound familiar? No, I never was involved with that. I, I wasn't Thank sure God. if I was, my leg was being pulled. Well, I, I, well, I it do could be, I imagine, but uh, no. I. I, I never heard of anybody having problems with parties, and they got a little bit wild. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't just like the it was real, real quiet. But, but basically, uh, you would uh, they'd end about four or five o'clock in the morning. Yeah, there was always an, on the weekends. There were always after. Yeah, somebody had groups. a party. Somebody had a party at some at a house. Like I can go up and down Neal Avenue and point to every house that I've been in for an after hour party um, because they were all apartments for college students then. They weren't these nice big. Victorian homes, they were all cut up into student apartments and stuff, and, and you would have uh, parties, uh, Fifth Avenue parties, and um, over here in the, when the Thurber, those Thurber apartments that are back behind the Giant Eagle now were brand new, it was Gay Central, and, uh, and uh, there were always parties every night there, and campus got every apartment. Let's talk about bars a little bit more. Um, Jerry, I noticed in your uh, bio in the program, you talked about a couple of different places you already talked about the Oasis Bar. It, you also mentioned a, is it Kiri Piano Bar? No, Kyra. Ky 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 I'm sorry for that. Kyra. Was that? I knew uh, the name. Was it that on Parsons uh -huh. with Oak? Yeah. Yes. It always had a, it was a piano bar in there. Right. And always wonderful music. And it was gay, completely gay. And uh, served good food, too. Oh, yes. It was, it was a fine, and it was a nice place, too. Uh, when you say a piano bar, do you mean somebody was in there performing, playing the piano and singing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was a, she, uh, I'm good friends with Jeanette Williams, and she reminded, that person reminded me of Jeanette Williams. And she's that type of a singer. But, uh, did you, you ever, know, did you ever play the piano or sing in there? No. No. No, I'm usually a uh, special program, something like that. Um, I don't know if many people know this. Um, there was a Trade Winds one. It was in Union Station. Um, we used to go over there sometimes, and you know, being a bad young person who didn't realize that gay people ever got old, um, <laughs> we called it the Wrinkle Room. And oh, it was pretty nasty. It was nasty. <laughs> I, I, I what did it mean? I'm there now, but you know, when I think back on it, the men who went there were probably in their late 30s and early 40s. Uh, but when you're 18, that's extremely old. Well, that's true. Um, but it was like there was this golden triangle downtown that you would you could go to, and there was there was the Kismet, there was the Trade Winds, and there was the Cats Meow. And if you got bored at one, you would just go. You would see people walking that block, block and a half, all night long. And then there was one other bar when I came out that was down in German Village, the Grotto, um, which isn't there anymore. Um, it's still an empty lot, even though when the, the owners told the owners of the Grotto, the, who owned the building, that Grange, Grange Insurance had bought it, because it was kind of across the street from Grange, and they were going to build on that lot, the lot is still empty. Um, it's never been built on. They just wanted the gay bar out of there. Did they raise it? It's gone, gone, gone. Um, Good times there. But that was the that was Columbus's first, as far as I know, Sunday tea dance, and it was packed. Mm -hmm. They had the first lighted 
disco floor. It was made up of four by fours and plexiglass and Christmas blinking lights underneath it. <laughs> it was high class. And uh, it was also, to my knowledge, the first back room, official back room in Columbus, and it was upstairs. And it was just a pitch black room with anything, anything and everything. With hay bales. There were hay, hay bales. There were, there, hay, were. there were hay bales up there. <laughs> for, uh, yes. Um, and you couldn't see a thing because you go in at two o'clock in the afternoon, and out of bright sunshine, and somebody dragged you upstairs, and you'd be like, mm -hmm. "There is everything." Eventually, your eyes would would kind of almost be able to pick out shadows and figures, but by then your pants were around your knees. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and the crowds would gather. The men would gather and swarm like bees. Yes. Mm. As soon as a new person came in, you you had no chance to. Let your eyes acquaint you were batting hands away, or, or not, <laughs> as the case may be. But uh, there was one other bar that was up on uh, campus that was an after-hour bar too. It was called uh, Something Two Thousand, and it was it was gay after two o'clock, and it was a juice bar, and uh, everybody was so high when we went in there. And there was one room that had a foam floor. And I remember everybody was just rolling all over it and having sex and all that stuff in there. But uh, Columbus didn't have an explosion of bars until the 80s. I think I came here in 76 and there were like seven. But some of them were very, very tiny little tiny. venues. There was one up at 161 in Cleveland Avenue. Oh, places. yeah. In a shopping center? In, sho in the shopping center. Yeah. It's still there. It's where that ABC liquor is on... 161. I think it's a Carlin 161, maybe there. What um, was the name of that place? Oh, I don't know. I never went up there. That was too close to home. I, I keep a journal. <laughs> I keep a journal. I can look it up for you. That's uh, those. True. Yeah. <laughs> With the exception of some memorable experiences, almost all of my cruising was restricted to bars. But then there was a lot of it in those bars. And I assume it still goes on, doesn't it? This isn't new. Uh, people still go to bars and cruise, surely. surely. It's I spent an awful lot of time there. I write comic songs. At one point, I wrote a comic song called Cruising. Uh, just denigrate the whole experience. See, my, my experience are totally different. I never went to bars to cruise. One, I had curly hair <coughs> when I had hair. I had really curly hair, and that was not the style, unless you had hair like Doug's. Because you either had really, really straight hair or you had an afro. And I, since I was in the middle, I didn't want to have an afro. I wanted to have straight hair, so you had to get your hot comb out. And you had to straighten that hair. Straighten and straight. Get that shag going, you know, and straightened out. Five minutes into a hot, sweaty bar, it was... So it's like, who the hell cared? And you were sweaty. I went to dance. I was a young kid. I went to dance. So I didn't care what happened at the bar. All my cruising happened before the bar or after the bar. I think I can, in those years, I can count on three fingers the number of people I met in a bar and actually left the bar with. There was three people. I'm not saying I didn't, I, there was no lack of sex, but it just never came from people in the bar. It was from cruising different spots around Columbus. And, and you know, at 18, you only have one thought in your mind anyway. You know, this is never the head that thinks, so you follow the other thing. That's my experience. I got very, very good at cruising in bars. There turned out to be rules that uh, were useful to know. I never liked it. <laughs> I could, plus, I was backward. I was, I, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I could have never sat up here and spoke to you people. I would have been crawling under the chair. And <clears throat> when the, the group of people I hung out with were the, the really beautiful people of Columbus at the time, and I was like the mascot, the comic relief in the group, you know. I was the one that everybody came up to and would buddy up to me to find out if the other guy liked them and stuff. So um, so I just did you know, I, I had much more, uh, I couldn't talk to people. If I was attracted, even to this day, if I'm attracted to somebody, it's very difficult for me to strike up a conversation with them, um, um, especially in a bar setting. If I'm and especially if it's a big bar where there's people are constantly 
you know what it's like. You go to a big bar, you start to talk to somebody, and that person never looks you in the eye. They're always looking over your shoulder, seeing who's walking by. You know, I was always intimidated by that. So um, I, I did much better going to Gordon's Ice Cream and meeting people there. <laughs> <laughs> what was the name of the bar where the Nationwide Arena is now? Kirby's. Herbie's. Kirby's. Kirby's. And it was something else before Herbie's. Um, 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 taboo. Taboo. Taboo, right. Doug, I'm curious, what did you learn were the rules of cruising? Uh, well, let's see. It's been so long since I've actually done it. Once I found the internet, you know, I, all of that was done. But the, uh, well, in, and again, this has got to be something you all know. Gall is all in these settings. You know, you have to get rid of the, the idea that you're going to be shy or that you can't walk up to people. And so you just have to steal yourself to do it. And in the beginning, I, I had all these elaborate lines. Uh, but then I had friends who disabused me of that. And he said, tell me what your line is. And I do the line. He said, too complicated. So I'd try another one. He'd say, too complicated. I said, well, what do you recommend? He said, try a low. <laughs> oh, I had one friend who used to go up and say, how'd you like a one-night stand? And he had plenty of, of uh, good times. No longer with us once that AIDS epidemic hit. But in bars, you have to catch people's eyes. And what most people do is if I'm staring at you and you catch me, I look away. You have to learn to not do that. You then stare them right down. And then I learned to wink. Winking turned out to be very, very useful. <laughs> and then once I got into the leather scene, I just point, come over here. That worked awesome. <laughs> Jerry, what were the, the cues that gay men used to acknowledge interest in each other in your experience? I really don't have any uh, good stories to tell you along that line. I, usually, if, if you got with your groups of people, you meet other people. And I really didn't have to go out to bars. I, of course, I like music so much that I was always going around where there, there was music. and. Uh, the dancing and things like that, but uh, uh, I was, of course, first intimidated, uh, but later on I became a little bit more friendly to meet people, in other words, start talking, if they start talking back to you, then you work into it, but a conversation could be just a normal conversation, that, and then eventually the person next to you is, was, was gay. Drop the pearls. <laughs> yeah, one by one. Well, there were, there were also little words that you would use, like if you were, if you were talking to somebody. Well, all the gay bars were downtown, so if you were talking to somebody, nobody went downtown at night. Downtown closed up, sidewalks rolled up at five o'clock, so nobody went downtown except gay people at night. So you'd be talking to somebody if you're interested. You, where do you go? Where do you do? Where do you go party or something? You know. And if they said, oh, I go downtown, you went, ha. You know, the, those were little catch words. Or you would, I don't know, you would, you would look for mannerisms. And you would, I, I mean, gay people are not over, are, are not, are not uh, uh, opposed to looking for stereotypes in their own people. Mm -hmm. You know, you look to see if a guy mm -hmm. sticks his finger out or if his wrist is a little limp, limp or, or that kind of stuff. And you, you, you. You learn to, we all have tells, it's just like playing poker, everybody has a tell, that you learn to recognize those little little tells. And I'll tell you, I lived all over the world, and the, the, the rules that I learned here, cruising in Columbus, stood me well in places like Hong Kong and Singapore and little, little country towns in Sardinia and um, in Japan where you can't speak the language, but I never, if we were in port one day, I found the freaking gay bar. And I never asked, I just found it. Because I would look for someone's tells and follow them, and I always found the gay bar. Or found a place to cruise, or found something in every place I went. So, and I kind of think that's kind of a lost art. I don't think young kids do that anymore. They, they, they don't sit, need to. They sit down at their computer and they go to Manhunt or they go to you know all these different websites and it's like come on over and they're at their door 15 minutes later, you know. So I I think this is kind of the cruising thing 
is kind of a lost art or a dying art. I think, that, you know, God forbid something happens to the internet or we go into another ice age and, <laughs> and, and everything, they might have to learn it all over again. But, but, uh, but, you know, with cruising, the rule is to be pirate bold. And I actually got very good at it. I had a relationship with a guy named Jerry that went on for 12 years, and Jerry was just amazing. He was brazen. Uh, he's the one who taught me not to look away. Instead, the look he gave him back is, oh, yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> and see if that didn't attract their attention. And people are, even if they're not interested, they're very flattered to be asked. And then Jerry and I got into the leather world, and we used to do three ways, and I'd take him into a crowded bar, the International Mr. Leather Secret. And I just, it was like fishing. I'd throw him out across the crowd, and then I'd reel him back and see who he had. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's two ways to be. There's the way to be Mr. Bold, and then there's Mr. Demure, and then the bold guys come to you. And it's just as just as enticing to be the shy guy, the demure guy, because they look at you and go, hmm, let's see if I can get this guy. You know, so there are two, well, two sure. sides to that. So, um, but it is, it, when, when you're street cruising especially, you have to be you have to be able to go up and, and talk to this guy or, or do something. Unfortunately, now, police are everywhere where you cruise, so where cruising happened, um, so you can't be all that bold that you end up in jail. The, uh, you mentioned that people go downtown, that was a sign people were gay. They, when I got here in 76, there was a big, the police were arresting everybody for jaywalking as they left the bars, and it was called gay walking, actually. And, and they knew what they were getting, you know, just because, well, they'd stand there outside gay bars, that would be another clue. Um, but something you said triggered another thought. Before I actually came out and started going to bars, I spent a lot of time going to bed with men who thought they were straight. And I got very good at seducing straight men, where once again I had rules, you know, and then that would work out, and then eventually some of these people would start turning up in bars later in life. But a lot of them were married with children. And as long as I was sleeping with straight men, that meant I was, wasn't gay. It's on the Don't table. you see? <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned jaywalking. Um, that was a really, it went on for years here that police would circle the clubs, especially on 3rd uh, downtown, and catch people, because everybody parked across the street from the front entrance of the old Kismet. Um, there was no back entrance like it used to be when you went in the Eagle. Everybody went in that front entrance on 3rd. And you parked across the street, uh, and uh, it was it became a cat and mouse game. Um, should I run across the street before the police pick me up? And I remember one night. Um, well, the kids used to have a summer picnic every year. Oh, oh um, yeah. Oh, good old Doris loved her. Oh, um, she was the owner of of the Kismet. Um, Describe that picnic. Mm. It was out on West Broad Street, <laughs> way, way out on West Broad Street, and Doris would bring in a tanker truck that had four taps on the side of it, and it was full of beer. Mm -hmm. It was all free. And everyone got ridiculously all the, drunk. <laughs> all the food was free, everything, and it was uh, along a creek and corn fields. woods and cornfields, and it was just this one whole se uh, Sunday. There was, uh, and it, people came from all over the Midwest for the Kismet picnic. You couldn't move in the Kismet the night before. You couldn't move in the cornfields either. No, <laughs> well you could. It's more like writhing instead of moving. Um, but uh, um, one night on a Saturday night before the Kismet picnic, I jaywalked and I got picked up. And I'll never forget it. It was Officer Gay, <laughs> <laughs> and he told me I would not be taken in if I performed oral sex on them. I said, just take me in. Because <laughs> I wasn't going to do it. And I spent the, that night, I spent the night, the only time I've ever been arrested, I spent the night in, in jail that night and got out the next day and then went straight out West Broad. <laughs> went right to the kids. What, was it a matter of principle? Or he was ugly? <laughs> <laughs> he was not that attractive, but I, it was a matter of principle. Good for you. Because... Hmm? You know, was, uh, my standards weren't all that high, so. <laughs> but, uh, um, no, uh, uh, I don't know why, jaywalking. But you'd still get a jaywalking ticket downtown. Columbus is notorious for that. 
always have. Let's let's talk about a, another area of where gay men would hang out, and that is uh, bath houses and <laughs> bookstores. Oh. And, and I'll, I'll I'll start the discussion. I don't have anything to share about the bookstores, or I'm sorry, about the bath houses. That wasn't something I was familiar with. But I can certainly remember a friend of mine when I was in college dragging me up to North Campus News after the bars. And in the back of North Campus News at that time, there were several hallways that were mm -hmm. lined with video arcade booths that showed porn films. Mm -hmm. And then there were some of them had glory holes in between them. Right. And then some of them you might just go into a booth with somebody who was there. You might grab somebody say, come on into a booth and uh, do what, whatever in the booth. And it seems like there was another one out on Morris Road there, too. There was. Uh, it's still the Zodiac. There. The Zodiac. It's still there, but it's now the Lion's Den. Um, and that whole back part that's not that wasn't open in the '90s. I don't know. I've been up there for a long time. Um, was all video booths, and it was two stories of video booths, and people would go and just walk and walk and walk, and they sometimes they'd go into a booth, and somebody go into the one next to them. And, use the glory holes. Sometimes people would go into the booths and there were a couple buddy booths that were double, you know, made specifically for two people. Um, but I have a really funny story about the bathhouse. Um, what's now Flex was the original Club Columbus. It opened in 1975. My two best friends and I had never been to a bathhouse. We heard it was coming, so we go, we kept we looked up in the phone book, and it had a phone listing. So every night, we'd be sitting around, call the bathhouse. You open yet? You open yet? <laughs> so finally, one night, they said, yeah, we're open. I said, is there anybody there? And they said, yeah, it's packed. I said, OK, we're coming out. We go out, walk in, have to buy this little card to get in. It was like $5 for a locker and the membership card. It was really, really cheap. And I walk in, I'm the only person there. I'm the first paying customer <laughs> in Columbus, Ohio. Um, but then three months later, they had this big grand opening. They had this huge smorgasbord with a suckling pig and all this other stuff. And that place was packed. And it became another meeting place in Columbus. You, I mean, people would go there before the bars, go to the bars, come back to it. It was a place where people, it actually, for a lot of people came from small towns to go to the bathhouse. They had no place to go in their small towns. They would be from like where my mother's from, Oak Hill in Jackson County. You know, back then there was like what, eight hundred people in town. If you were the one gay person, you did not want to be known as that one gay person. So they would come to the big city Columbus or Cleveland and go to the bathhouses because they didn't know anything else to they had their little Bob Dameron cruise guidebook. And that told them there was a bathhouse on East Livingston Avenue in Columbus, and there we go. So you would meet a lot of small town men. You'd meet a lot of married men, a lot of really young guys who's their first experience. Um, so it did, the bathhouse pre HIV AIDS um, did uh, really serve a purpose in, in Columbus. Well, and the, I went to the, the same. Bathhouse you're talking about. In fact, I went to them in a number of cities. The mine shaft in New York was something mm, else, too. Check your clothes as you walk in. And you had to, and what a shame. Um, but I, there are bathhouses still out there, and I assume they haven't changed all that much. But in the pre AIDS days, there was an orgy room, and there was an orgy going on in it 24 7. Oh, yeah, and after the bars, it would get to the point where you could barely move and people would just go from one sexual experience to the other. There was no condoms being used and uh, um, it was, I'm ashamed that I participated in that. I, I'm ashamed. But not, <laughs> but not just in the bathhouses, in the garage, mm -hmm. in the Palladium, they used to have back rooms in New oh, York yeah. City that you could go into and it was pitch black and you didn't know who was on you, top of you. Well, and there, it depends on what state you're in. Florida had such places too, and DC had a, a lot of them, and uh, yeah, California. And this was all over the United States. You could right. go to medium sized cities like Omaha or, right. or uh, Kansas City or places like that, and they had these kind of things also. But, um, um, what was I going to say? Oh, um, you said you're ashamed of this. I'm not ashamed of it. No, I'm clenching. It's, 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 I wouldn't be sitting here talking you know, about it. It really is all of these experiences that we're talking about. It's what 
has made us today. We were just the lucky ones. Mm -hmm. What well, have you learned? Uh, I went. I was a visiting professor at the University of California Hastings Law School, which is in downtown San Francisco, eighty-two, eighty-three, and I was just beginning to explore the leather world. And like the San Francisco Eagle, every Sunday afternoon was just packed as far as the eye could see with leathermen. And I went back like 10 years later, and on Sunday afternoon, I went down to the Eagle, and there was no one there. Uh, you know, just one or two guys in leather. And I said, what happened to everybody? And he said, they all died. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I was stationed in San Francisco area in 78, 79, and 80. And it was a wild time, and you had to remember the only thing that you had to worry about was cured by a shot of penicillin or a little tube of quell. That was it. You know? <laughs> so there was no reason to worry about anything. So I, I always say there's, I've lived two lives. I've lived pre-HIV and post-HIV. So I left San Francisco in October 1980, not long after the very first rumblings, the first articles about a gay cancer and, and things was coming out. And I went to Japan and I literally um, credit my staying in the Navy and going to Japan instead of, I could have gotten out or I could have stayed in. And going to Japan has saved my life because out of all of my friends in San Francisco and Columbus, I probably have six or seven left now from that time frame. Um, I was a little bit insulated, a lot of people here weren't, because I wasn't here to do all of the funerals. Um, I learned about them via the U.S. mail. I learned later my father went to all of the funerals for me, uh, even though you know he knew I was gay, we never talked about it. He knew because my mom told him. We never had a discussion. To the day he died, we never had that discussion because when I found out he had went to all of those funerals for me, not only did he go, he would donate money to the then fledgling um, Columbus Gate uh, Task Force, AIDS Task Force, and to if they were in New York and he sent flowers, he would send money to to the AIDS Task uh, Force in New York City or San Francisco. So um, I was insulated that way, although I did lose hundreds of, of friends. Then I went back to San Francisco in the 80s and it was really weird because I could not have fun in that city anymore. It was like every place I looked I would see um, shadows of people that I knew. I'd go past um, bars that I, I used to play pool at the Cinch on Polk Street all the time. I'd play, you know, go in there with friends and we drink beer and play pool and eat their peanuts out of their barrels and throw them all over the floor. And I couldn't even walk in that place because I knew so many people that I played pool with were no longer no longer there. I'd go, you'd walk up Castro and you'd see all these young kids acting at being, you know, having these happy faces on, but behind all of them you didn't see a real happy face. You saw this, you know, vacant stare because they had lost so many of their friends and everything. So for people in my age group and people, I think most people in 40 or over have this pre-post HIV life. So it's, it's, it, it's really weird to be sitting here talking about all the fun we had pre when we've experienced everything since the early 80s. And the resistance in the early 80s to using condoms and things that, um, it's like, um, taking a shower with a raincoat on, or a, I experimented with dental dams once upon a time. That was every bit as much fun as licking a raincoat. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of I'd rather die first, which unfortunately was a bad motto. And it wasn't until I think gay porn movies started mandating the use of condoms in the 80s that it became kind of widespread that people use condoms. Um, and then the use of retroviral drugs now have kind of let younger people especially, and I wish there were a few more younger people here tonight, that um, they're now doing, being very unsafe. You know, you bug chasers. It, well, I don't know if so much as bug chasers. I think they think in the back of their mind, if it's not, if HIV is not cured, it's 
something you can live with and be treated for. Mm-hmm. And um, and I know, and they see these people who have been living. I mean, there are people who have been HIV positive since the early '80s and are still alive. So they're seeing these people and saying, "Well, that's going to be me." I know part of it is I'm getting older and I'm getting preachy and and all this stuff, but I just want to take them and shake them and, and say, "Wake up!" For the three of you, was um, as we came into the '80s, was there a single event, whether it would be media or in your own personal lives, that changed your promiscuous behavior? I mean, was it what's going on in the news? Maybe I need to change, or my friend is real sick. Maybe I need to change. Or... Well, I think we were all worried, but those of us who survived this era and did not come down had lucky things happen, like you off in Japan. I entered into a 12-year relationship, and we were monogamous for the first, oh, seven, eight years of that, and that's really when the epidemic got going, so it was just luck, otherwise I'd be dead. But there was a, I don't know, there were no, I don't remember any, well, you start going to funerals, that... Yeah, one, uh, one of my... The the youngest one that died from AIDS was 19. He was the first one that picked it up for some reason or other. And uh, then I saw, of course at that time, I had a very ill mother and a very ill father and a store to run, so I was not being very promiscuous around. So I I, was no worry that I was going to get anything. But uh, seeing, seeing these kids that I loved dearly die, uh, and that that was in the in the seventies. The heyday of the par- of the parlor was in, uh, through the the year the seventies, and of course then uh, in the eighties, why uh, some of them moved away, and uh, but then one by one, I mean, I was getting notices of them. What's really the timeline of the disease? When did somebody actually say, hey, maybe we have a problem? How long did it take to recognize that? And then how long was it before they said, oh, it's not just in New York and in, in, in San Francisco? The first article started appearing in, in the San Francisco Chronicle and the New York Times, I think in 1979, that they were the pockets of gay men who were coming down with um, carpacy sarcoma. Um, the, which is a really, really rare um, cancer. And they had no idea why it was gay men that were coming down with it. Um, I remember originally it was called GERD. Mm-hmm. Yes. Gay something. And gay related immune disorder. I re- yeah, I remember reading, you know, I was in Japan by then. I remember picking up a Newsweek magazine and there was this like, five page article about it and it was talking about it, it could be caused by poppers, it could be caused by all kinds of stuff. They had no idea. And then it was, um, I remember hearing things about Dr. Fauci in San Francisco was becoming really uh, interested in treating AIDS patients and trying to figure out what was going on. And this was the early 80s. Um, and then I think it was around 84 when they isolated the 84, 85, it was before 85 because I was in the Navy and 85 was the first time we had to have an HIV test. So it was in the early 80s that they, in France, um, they isolated the, the germ or whatever it is of uh, uh, HIV. So, um, and all through this time, the, the number of cases kept rising and rising and rising and rising and it, it left the gay uh, areas of New York and Miami and San Francisco, and they were starting to pop up in places like Columbus and um, Knoxville, Tennessee, and, and it was always, at the first it was always among gay men, and they kind of figured out it was sexually transmitted. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, and it's just went up from that, and then there was the rise of, of ACT UP, you know, if you, if you remember the 80s at all, you remember Ronald Reagan in his, in his first term in office never once said the word AIDS, which was really strange because he was an actor and he had been um, surrounded by gay actors and studio people and grips and lighting people and his whole life. Nancy Reagan was the same way and he turned his back on the HIV epidemic um, 
And it was a huge thing when he finally said the word AIDS, and he was forced to, into saying it by ACT UP. Um, there were huge sit-ins. It was the first time that gay people really, after Stonewall, took to the streets and demanded um, action. So, But before ACT UP, there was that period where the gay community's reaction to all of this was defiance. Well, yeah. uh, they're trying to take away our sexual revolution, and we're not going to go along, and so forth. And oh, Diane Feinstein was almost pilloried in San Francisco for for even thinking about closing the bathhouses in San Francisco. Um, and they never did close. Well, the bathhouses closed. Oh, they did? They did close in San Francisco. They're not open in San Francisco oh. instead. There are other type of clubs, but San Francisco does not have a bathhouse. Um, if you ever watch the Harvey Milk story on TV, you see this, uh, this whole um, scenario acted out where they have the meetings and someone's playing bd it was one of bd wong's very first tv movies um, he played harvey mills asian boyfriend um, like he i've never it. seen this film. i didn't um, know it existed it was, uh, it was on tv i think it was one of hbo's first mm -hmm. one of when hbo was first was huh. new and it was in the 80s and, and stuff. you mean that the band played on well, maybe that was it, because the they band played on. And then there's, yeah, it was the band played on. And then there was um, a Longtime Companion. If you've not seen that, it plays on Logo from time to time, which is on, now in Columbus. So watch the band played on. Logo's in Columbus. Logo's in Columbus. It's on Channel 137 on it. Uh -huh. Time Warner. But it does play from time to time, and it, it gives you a pretty accurate timeline of HIV. Plus, you get to see a really, really young Mary Louise Parker. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's let's do this. Uh, I think our original intention was to try to wrap up about nine o'clock. Is there anyone else that has a, a question or uh, a story that they've been thought of that they'd like to share as a part of tonight's proceeding? If anyone has any questions or comments, you should feel free to offer them up. All right. Well, if it, if something occurs to you, feel free to say the word. Jerry, I wanted to get back and ask you about a couple of other things that uh, you had mentioned in the program. You referred to some gay bars that, or some bars, I'm sorry, where gay people went, that were located in the Seneca Hotel and the Neal House. Oh, can well, you tell me any more about that? Well, there was a, a, a lounge in, in the, the uh, Seneca Hotel. And where was and the was, Seneca Hotel located at? It's, uh, well, it's being worked on now. I saw it's completely boarded up. I don't know what's going to happen to it. Broad but, and uh, Grant. Grant. Yeah, Broad Grant. Broad Grant. Broad Grant. Yeah, and they had a they had a dance uh, hall in the back that would have a big band, but uh, Friday nights uh, our group would meet it at the bar at the Seneca, and we'd uh, have our drinks and so forth, and and then go out to uh, a restaurant out on Livingston. Anybody know what that was? It's closed now. I can't think of it, but anyway, there was a routine that we did there, but it was not. Uh, I wouldn't say it was it was strictly gay in the bar, but most of uh, because there were at least twenty five of us, and it was. Uh, but we enjoyed that so much uh, the week ending and Friday and so forth. Now, were, were, were the staff members gay there? No, but we had no problems. But we were not. How about the Neil House? Tell me about what that was. The Neil House was a bar. Um, was a pickup place, and um, it was uh, nothing there except the bar and the bartender. But uh, you could go there and and met people. And where was the Neil House located? The Neil House was right across from the Capitol. It's where the Huntington building is yeah. now. That the didn't come down until that the eighties. Yeah, that, yeah mm -hmm. because I had uh, chaired a convention at the Neil House in the late 70s. Doug, I, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I've heard you tell the story before of your participation in the first Pride March sponsored by Stonewall Columbus here in Columbus. Can you, can you tell us what that was like? Uh, you know, I said at that discussion of the history of all this, that was the most incredible moment because Stonewall had just started the prior fall this was the spring of 82, June, and we were going to have that gay pride march. And we were terrified that no one at all would come. 
It would just be the members of Stonewall Union, as it was called in those days, and there were like 15 of us. So, you know, 15 of us marching down the street was not going to be the big event that we were planning. <laughs> and you have to also appreciate it was such a very different era. Uh, homosexuals were anathema to the whole society, and the thought that they would walk down the street together was, was going to be a tremendous act of courage out of the people who did it. Or the people who stood on the sidelines at age 18 and watched, uh, like Rob over here. And the, uh, so we sent out flyers all over the uh, Ohio and tacked up on all the gay bars and told people if you cannot march, uh, with, uh, if you want to have a mask on, we had a group that marched with paper bags on. Were you around for this, 82? And the, uh, we, we ended up, we had 825 people showed up. We know because we counted them. And then last year, I was the co-MC at the Pride March, and we had 100,000 people. And to see it go from 825 to that is just the most thrilling thing. And I, you're talking about the tape of the first gay Pride March. I cannot watch that without breaking down into tears and crying like a baby. The bravery of those people. That was just amazing. Uh, as, as Doug mentioned, I learned about the planned march through one of those bar newspapers. I think it was like, we, there was one out that was published in Cleveland called like the Metro or something, Metro, Metro or something. Anyways, at the, at, at, the, at the gay bar in Mansfield, they would have this bar magazine that was published either in Columbus or Cleveland that mentioned the march. And so a group of us decided to come down. And uh, it's, it, at that time, it's still the, the kickoff point was over at Goodale Park but they marched down to the State House for a rally. They didn't go to Bicentennial Park. And uh, it, it, as Doug described, it was a pretty amazing event. Uh, there were lots of people there. The, the TV news media was there. Actually, one of the things we're going to show next week is, is a video of a portion of the parade and then the TV news coverage that evening of the parade, which is kind of entertaining to hear how the uh, TV newscasters deal with this idea of gay people marching. And then the rally was just amazing, too to have people standing on the State House steps and talking about being gay and being proud and not being afraid uh, to be who you were. I, I just remember it was a, a very moving experience and uh, one that I've, I've never forgotten about. And when it was over, the members of Stonewall Union, we walked down the street together and we couldn't believe we had pulled it off. And that is the greatest natural high I've ever had in my life just this incredible feeling of euphoria that this had actually happened and it meant that the organization was going to continue and look at it now. Does anyone on the panel have anything else that they wanted to share that I didn't ask about or that uh, stories or anecdotes that have occurred? Well, I just want to say it's really important and I, I have to commend you for what you're doing with the Ohio Historical Society and Stonewall. Columbus is doing with the Ohio Historical Society. The, Gay Ohio History Initiative. Um, if we don't chronicle our history, it's going to be lost. Um, it's like any history. Our history goes back thousands and thousands of years ago. Nobody knows for sure. I mean, we can say that that uh, Hannibal was gay. We can say that who Colin Farrell played Alexander. Alexander the Great was gay, but do we really know? We don't know because there was no written history. We have to write this history down. Um, so go home tonight and, and look through your personal archives. We all have them. We have photo albums. We have programs of concerts we went to um, and all of this stuff. And look at it. And, just, and, and all of that is your personal history. They're collecting it at the Ohio State. Rob has been system. working. He's been working and working clock. and working and gathering. Give it to Rob. They're being all of this is being collected and archived at the Ohio Historical Society right now at, for the Gay Ohio History Initiative. Get in touch with Rob if you have things like this. And Stonewall Democrats just donated all of our 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 uh, newsletters from when we started up until when the newsletter ended. Things like that are important. Uh, it, it shows a history and a continuity of our our collective history. So get behind it. He needs money too. So 
um, that's my shield and not the you know. So it's really important. So these things are great. Um, we're documenting these kind of things, but everybody else has a documented history that you can pull together of your own personal history. It's important to pass it along to somebody. Because a lot of us don't have families to pass along to. This is our family. So let's pass it down to each other and make sure we don't forget what's going on. And I hope somebody's got some more memorabilia from the Jewel Box Review that used to come through here years ago. Now, now what was that? The Jewel Box Review was the gay, uh, what do you call it? You know, like Broadway show? Yeah, it was a, a very, very... A review was a very, very, very famous. Review, and it was very, very popular. Very popular. Pop pop and it used to come through here like once every couple of years, way yeah. back then. Well, there was uh, a representative <laughs> from uh, uh, when I grew up down at Caddis Pike in, in Bridgeport. He lived across the street. Mm -hmm. And he was in the Jewel Box Review. And I, when I came up, when I... I'm back in Columbus, and I found out the Jewel Box Review was going to be playing. Mm -hmm. uh, I went over to see it, and it was marvelous. I mean, it really was. Right. And initially, when I first saw it, used to be at the old burlesque. I can't. Was that on Rich Street or Main Street where they used to have that old burlesque? Theater way back yeah, the in the 50s. Yeah, theater was on High Street. It yeah, was on South High Street, High. Uh -huh. and I remember High seeing it first time seeing the Jukebox Review there. Yeah. Oh, huh. Well, then they came to uh, the nightclub that's been torn down uh, out on Olin Tangy, Riviera, I believe they called it. Oh. And that was a big uh, affair then, right. up there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I hope somebody's got I don't know whether I can get any. Uh, the person I'm talking about just died this last year, so I have no way of knowing whether I if there was any. I might. I, his partner. I'll try to see if I can find okay. something that would be interesting. Yeah. Any other parting thoughts from the panel? All right. Any other questions or comments from the audience? Yeah, just a, a quick one. Um, when I started dealing with Coming out, I was about 21, and it was the uh, summer that Rock Hudson said, I'm gay, and then he died. Mm -hmm. And that particular summer, I was on campus, and uh, it's like everything that I'd ever heard that I picked up in conversation, this might be gay, that might be gay. Every one of those places, I, I would look at from a distance and never quite cross the threshold. I lived a couple blocks from Gordon's, and I would never go in there. I lived uh, a couple blocks from, um, well, no, I had, I thought about getting into the theater program at Ohio State, and I heard, well, that's all gay people, so no, I ran from that. It really wasn't. Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I, um, I heard about Larry's Bar. Larry's had this <laughs> reputation. Larry's has been gay for as long as I know one gay person that's ever written. That's, <laughs> that's the thing. I, I read in some college guide a couple years later that said it's never been a gay bar. It's a graduate student bar. They call it a gay bar to keep out the undergraduates. It's <laughs> because everybody knows everyone named Larry is gay. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's like all these places that for a lot of people were quite welcoming and, and receptive. To me, I saw them as threats and kept my distance. So now, every once in a while, when I go into Larry's, I've been there a few times, I think, this is just a dump. It's just a dive <laughs> bar. You know? But so were the gay bars back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Kismet was really kind of dirty. And you know, you the original Kismet was on 4th Street. It wasn't no, on 3rd. It was a very small bar back then. It was. It was. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that. It was right through the alley from where it is. Yeah. The Eagle is now. Yeah. Well, it's not there anymore. Oh, I know. It's closed. Now. Oh, I know. I know. All right. Well, with that, we'll close tonight's program. Thank you all for coming, and I would certainly like to thank the panel.